Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. Our program promotes progressive populist perspectives on the issues of the day. The Alliance for Democracy is dedicated to creating a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. Our guest today is Professor Emeritus of Economics from American University and co-director of economics for equity and the environment. So welcome to the program, Robert Hanel. Good to be with you, yeah, David. Good, good. good to be with Thank you. you. Uh, so we want to talk about taxes, the Oregon uh, economy, the Oregon budget, and all those problems associated with it. So why don't you start out, just talk a little bit about Measure f uh, 97 last year, what it was, what happened to it, and where we're at now. Well, as voters in Oregon should remember, um, you voted down Measure 97 by a whopping 18%. Um, so it wasn't close. Um, and the bad news is Measure 97 was a very, very good measure. Um, the context is that Oregon has a, a serious budget crisis. I'm oh, sorry, before you do that, Measure 97, what did it do? Measure 97 would have raised um, an extra $3 billion, roughly, per year um, by increasing the tax rate um, on sales above $25 million annually in state. That would have affected 1,000 corporations, most of which are large out-of-state corporations. So 1,000 corporations would have had to pay a higher tax based on their volume of sales. And the, there were two basically very good things about it. One was that it was going to, co this tax was going to come from the largest corporations in the state. And corporations pay less in taxes in the state of Oregon than every other state in the United States. So here we are, we're supposed to be kind of a liberal state and we have a liberal attitude toward taxes, and yet we are at the bottom, we are rock bottom in terms of what percentage of of our revenue we're collecting from corporations in the state, which is also why a lot of other people in the state feel I'm overtaxed. Mm -hmm. If you undertax the corporate community to the extent that, that Oregon does, um, then you're going to get people feeling that, gee, I'm paying a lot of taxes already. Um, but in any case, that's what Measure 97 okay. would have done. Right. It, would have, it would have solved the two big problems we have, which are we are in desperate need of more revenue, um, we can talk about why, um, and it would have done it by finally collecting taxes from the people who, quite frankly, have been, you know, have have not been anteing up. Um, unfortunately, the voting populace was bamboozled by a twenty-eight million dollar campaign that the business community put into mm -hmm. to defeating sure. Measure Ninety Seven, and they confused enough voters so that it was voted down. Yeah, and I I, th I think th that figure made it the most expensive initiative campaign in Oregon's history. Yes, the opposition paid more to defeat this than than we've had for any ballot measure in the history of the state. Mm -hmm. um, and what that's landed us in is a situation where we have a one point six billion dollar budget deficit. Sometimes it's, it, the number could be 1.6, 1.8, it depends on who's counting exactly what. Mm -hmm. um, but that's actually, the, the, in addition to that, we are two to three billion dollars short per year um, in terms of being able to adequately fund public education K through 12, um, health care and senior care programs. Um, Oregon is, <clears throat> I think we have the fourth worst graduation rates. Um, we have the third largest class sizes, I'm talking about of any state in the United States for K mm -hmm. through 12. Um, and it's because we spend less per pupil than 34 other states. Um, again, Oregon, liberal Oregon, mm -hmm. how can this be? And right. the answer is, 
Well, the state government is so starved for funds, largely because corporations haven't been paying their share, um, that that's the kind of crisis we're in. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, I, I have heard that people in Mississippi now say they don't want to be like Oregon. Um, on that score, that's right. In terms of how much is the state paying per pupil for, for public education, mm -hmm. we are that bad that we rank below practically, that we, we can rank below Mississippi. Yeah. Um, so talk a little bit about how much corporations used to pay versus how much they pay now and maybe a little bit about the mechanism that has caused that change. Well, I mean, there, there are a lot of myths that, I mean, one, one of the things that I have come to realize as an economist is that wealthy people and corporations are very smart about taxes. Um, they take it very seriously. Mm -hmm. And they pretty much understand what their interests are. The amazing thing is how often the rest of us do not seem to understand where our just regular old personal interests lie. Um, so, and I think there's reasons for this. Um, we've been, we've fallen victim to sort of two great myths that corporations and sort of the media that sponsor the, their think tanks have managed to propagate, which is, oh, well, corporations are the great job creators. And if a state taxes corporations heavily, they will leave the state and you know, they will take their jobs elsewhere. Um, and the other myth is resistance is futile. Mm -hmm. That if you tax the corporations, they will simply raise their prices and they will pass this on to the consumer. Um, the first thing to notice is those two things can't both be true. If they really did, if they were really able to go ahead and pass it on to the consumer all the time, well, then they wouldn't have to move out of state, would they? Mm -hmm. um, it turns out that there is no correlation between how heavily states tax corporations and prices in the state or employment in the state. Um, this is just a myth they've created, um, but it's a powerful myth because, oh, we can't raise corporate. I, I think many people in Oregon voted against Measure 97 because they thought we we're gonna, we'll lose jobs. Uh, and many it, yes. people voted against it because they thought it's just gonna be passed on as, as price increases to me. Uh, yeah, and, and of course, Oregonians have this traditional uh, dislike for sales tax taxes and it was presented as it just was, another sales tax. It was presented as a sales tax and the one thing Oregonians I think have done, this is one place where Oregonians have voted sensibly, you know, over and over and over again. They have said we don't want a sales tax, we know it's regressive. Mm -hmm. um, they were fooled into thinking that Measure 97 would end up being regressive. What they didn't realize, and, and when we talk about what's now going to be discussed and is being discussed, and perhaps is what's going to be passed in the state legislature, gross receipts tax, there, there are different kinds of gross receipts taxes. Um, most of them are bad. Um, as um, Anna Marum wrote a very informative column in The Oregonian. I think it came out on March 31st. And she quoted a very prominent economist who works on taxes who said, well, gross receipts taxes shouldn't ever be our first choice or our second choice. Um, they're that bad. Um, and very few states have them. Washington state has one. Mm -hmm. Ohio has one. Texas has one. And apparently our state legislatures are studying those experiences, but I don't know what they're studying because the word is out on them that these are terrible taxes. Yeah, yeah. and Washington State has in the nation the worst tax system, the most regressive tax That's system. That's right, that of all 50 states, Washington State has the most regressive state tax system in the entire country. This is not what you want to emulate. No. Now, well then, but wasn't Measure 97 a gross receipts tax, and therefore why wouldn't it be subject to the standard criticisms? Mm -hmm. um, it was a very special kind of gross receipts tax. And, and to be honest, when I was first approached by the campaign, asked, well, as an economist, will you look at this, and would you, you, know, would you be willing to testify as an economist or write columns in favor of this as an economist? My first reaction was, wait a minute, a gross receipts tax? This isn't the way we usually like to go. We like progressive income taxes. We like progressive corporate taxes. We don't like gross receipts taxes. And then I realized, but this was a very special one. 
it was only going to apply to a thousand, the thousand biggest corporations. Mm -hmm. The huge difference there is those corporations engage in a national pricing strategy. They don't have different prices on the same product in different stores in the state. And more importantly, if they're the only ones paying the tax, they can't just jack up their prices even if they want to because they will lose sales to all of the businesses who aren't hit by this tax because, and, 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 and we check to see. And in every major market, well over 50% of sales would never have been affected by the Measure 97 tax at all, mm -hmm. which meant that if you were affected and you raised prices, you were gonna lose your customers to everybody else. Mm -hmm. So it was a very cleverly designed, I, I mean, I was amazed that the people who come up with it were smarter than the rest of the economists I knew. Um, they had designed a gross receipts tax so that it was literally impossible for the corporations to pass it on to the consuming public. But their $28 billion in advertisements and TV ads mm -hmm. convinced a lot of people that it was going to be passed on. Uh, yeah, because there's no, no requirement they actually be honest in, in, in a TV ad. I was absolutely amazed. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing that was amazing was you had farmers and small business people on their ads saying, this is going to kill me. It would have actually helped level the playing field for small businesses because mm -hmm. they would not have been subject to the tax. And their large competitors who they are constantly in difficult competition with would have been subject to the tax mm -hmm. and unable to pass it on as price increases. So that was very unfortunate. So we had, we had an unfortunate outcome. Um, on election night, we were hosting a party and I knew that if Measure 97 passed, it would be very, very close. I didn't think we would win, lose that badly. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I didn't expect Trump to win. Uh, yeah. um, <laughs> so I was prepared for a disappointment on Measure 97, but um, quite frankly, the disappointment, <laughs> the big disappointment was so big that um, you know, it was hard to be. It was hard to be upset over Major Ninety Seven because mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, right. a bigger disaster had yeah. struck. But what this means is that everything is right back in the state legislature's lap mm -hmm. again. Um, and I should say that the the governor and the Democratic Party leadership had encouraged people to do a ballot measure um, because they knew how difficult it would be to pass any decent, significant tax reform in Salem. And because there's a reason for that that people should understand. Y yes. In Oregon, um, the anti-tax people, the conservative anti-tax people, decades ago, managed to pass a very significant change in Oregon state tax law, um, which is in large part responsible for the situation we find ourselves in, which is way underfunded for public programs that are just going begging. Mm -hmm. um, and that is that you need a 60% voting majority in both houses to pass a tax increase. Right. Um, and the Dems don't have it. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have a Democratic governor now, and the Dems are in the majority in both houses, but not in 60% either place. So you, and if Republicans, were, if they continue to kowtow, if the Republicans in our state legislature kowtow to the national Republican party and refuse to ever vote for any tax increase at all, um, then we're kind of stuck. Mm -hmm. um, and because that means that our students will be undereducated, um, it means that, I mean, I call it, it puts us on, a, it puts us on the road to become Appalachia West. Mm -hmm. um, because if you underfund public education and building up your human capital, and you underfund the kind of infrastructure you need for sort of businesses of the future, then you will become a backwater in the new future global economy. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that Oregon is sitting here unable to pull an education system you know, out of its low rank um, and unable to, to basically fund the health care and the senior care programs that are going wanting mm -hmm. means that that's the track we're on. Yeah. Um, so that's the dilemma that we're in. Um, so that's why the Democrats were hoping that the ballot measure would get us over the hurdle because 60, 
getting Republicans to vote in Salem for tax increases is near impossible. Yeah, and, and of course there are a couple of Democrats who tend to vote with the Republicans quite frequently that make it even more difficult. That's right. You seldom will you not lose one or two Democrats um, yeah. on an issue where you shouldn't. Yeah. Yeah, so talk a little bit about the response to that in the legislature. There are some proposals there. Talk about those proposals. Well, here's the irony. So after spending $28 billion hammering away about how Measure 97 is this terrible um, gross receipts tax um, that's going to cause pyramiding in prices, what apparently is being discussed in the state legislature is, you guessed it, a gross receipts tax. A gross receipts tax. Um, and I have no inside knowledge about the legislature on this. And this is, this is where we have behind the scene deals making and we've got you know, all sorts of stuff going on. Um, I'm not privy to any of that. Um, so my information is based on a very interesting column that Anna Marum wrote and published in the Oregonian on the 31st of March. And she explained that what's, what the legislature is talking about, it's a representative Haas who um, is a Democrat in Beaverton um, and who's chair of the Senate Budget Committee. And, um, and a representative um, Johnson, who I think is from Hood River, uh -oh. who's a Republican. And the two of them are putting together something which is the kind of gross receipts tax that they have in Washington and Ohio and Texas. The kind, it's a very bad tax. Mm -hmm. They want a very low, they're gonna, it's a much lower tax, so it's not gonna raise nearly enough revenue. Um, and it's gonna apply to all sales over one million. Well, that's most sales. So when you apply it to all sales over, first of all, that means this one really is going to affect small business. Right, um, because 97 applied to sales over $25 million, is that right? Yes. Right, okay, so, so dramatic difference. A dramatic difference, and our Oregon in the aftermath of the defeat of Measure 97, the major suggestion for a change that they made was, you know, we could actually raise it to only on sales over a hundred million. And that would have cut the number of companies affected down from a, a thousand to 288. Mm -hmm. And yet, because those 288 are so big, we would still have collected $2 billion extra in revenue from them. Wow. So we could have even fine tuned it to make it even less applicable you know, to more businesses. Right. But in any case, the one they're considering is like a 0.2 or a 0.5 or a 0.7% increase on all sales over a million annually in state. That will affect almost all businesses. And it means that when you affect all businesses, then they will be able to raise prices mm -hmm. without loss of, they don't have to fear I'm gonna lose my business to a business that didn't have its taxes raised and therefore isn't raising its prices. So the thing they're considering is going to do exactly what Measure 97 would not have done, which its opponents accused it of. It's going to mean that it's easy for the business community to pass it on to consumers. Mm -hmm. It will be highly regressive. And because pretty much every business is being affected, the kind of pyramiding problem that economists have been aware of with, with, with gross receipts taxes will actually be maximized. Um, so our state legislators appear to have gotten it exactly backwards. Mm -hmm. um, if you're gonna have a gross receipts tax, the only way you do it is by making it apply very narrowly only to the very small, largest businesses. And in some sense, this is sort of an intellectual problem because the general rule in taxes is you want an income tax, um, for instance, to be as broadly applied as possible. Because the broader the tax is and the fewer who are exempted from paying it, then the rate can be lower mm -hmm. um, and it's generally more fair. But if you're gonna go the gross receipts tax route, you wanna do just the opposite. You want to apply it to this. You want to apply it narrowly, so it cannot be passed on, and it will not pyramid. Um, I don't quite know who is advising the legislatures about this. Um, 
and you know where they've gotten their ideas. Um, the article in the Oregonian said they're studying the Washington and Texas and Ohio systems. Well, if they're studying, they should know that economists will tell you these are very bad ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition, apparently one of the things that's on the table is, oh, well, if we raise, if we do a low-level gross receipts tax on sales over a million, then we can eliminate the entire corporate income tax in the state oh. of Oregon. Um, so that would be... That would be a double dose of just where we don't want to go. I mean, this is the kind of tax reform that th this is. This is tax reform of exactly the wrong kind, and it's very disturbing to hear that the people are chairing the committees. These are also people who the 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 Joint Ways and Means Committee for the House and the Senate held hearings all over the state mm -hmm. um, before this session. And I went and testified, and I went to some of these. Mm -hmm. um, tons of people showed up. They were huge. They, they were, were huge. huge. And I was there. I heard what 95% of the people testifying were saying two things. You've got to increase revenue substantially. We can't tinker. It can't be a tinkering anymore. You can't raise this a little bit and cut a little here. We've got 1.6 billion shortfall, and we're 3 billion short on public education that's just dying on the vine here. Um, so we gotta raise more revenue, that was universally what people were saying. And it's gotta come from the business community. The one thing Measure 97 managed to do was make it apparent that the news got out during the campaign. Oregon is 50 out of 50 mm -hmm. in terms of how much we collect from corporations. So they kept hearing that. Um, so there were like 35 of them sitting up at a, at a podium and people's huge audiences going to the microphone, saying this over and over again. Um, it doesn't look like they listen very well. Mm -hmm. They seem to be tinkering and talking about even reducing corporate income taxes um, when we need to be significantly increasing revenues. And they seem to be going about it in a way that would be a a huge boon to the business community and end up being a very regressive tax on Oregon consumers, okay. worse than a sales tax, to be honest. Yeah. So you've uh, given us some idea of the problems of the major thrust of reform in Oregon now. What would you suggest as an alternative to that? Okay. There's a lot of things that are on the, that, that, that have been suggested. Um, I think there's three really big ones that are important. Um, one is we, sh we should still do a gross receipts tax on sales over $100 million. It would be the easiest, best way to collect a huge, big chunk of money. Mm -hmm. um, and it would affect only 288 companies. Um, I'm willing to bet that there's probably a, not a single resident in Oregon, unless you, sh unless you hold a lot of shares in one of these 288 companies. And these mm -hmm. are big national companies. Um, there's no way that you would end up paying any of this tax. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be the first thing. Okay. Um, but if the legislature is not gonna go with that kind of a gross receipts tax that applies only to a small number of very large companies, they should not consider gross receipts tax at all. Because if they're looking at, at the kinds of gross receipts taxes that Washington, Ohio, and Texas has had, this is taking us down the wrong road. Mm -hmm. So you could still do a gross receipts tax that was a good one, that was sort of an improvement really on the Measure 97 okay. one. Um, the other thing that's... We've got three minutes. The other thing that's, that people should understand is that about 10 years ago, it, this has to do with the corporate income tax in Oregon. It's assessed based only on in-state sales. Mm -hmm. Now, up until 10 years ago, that wasn't the case. And that's not the way it's done in almost every other state. In every other state, they look at employment, how much employment and your physical property and your in-state sales. Well, in Oregon, there's a huge difference between doing it one way or the other. Because Intel, um, Nike, um, Greenbrier, what's the clothing, Columbia Sportswear. Mm -hmm. Those are four of the big companies operating in the state. But 
they sell most of their stuff out of the state. But they employ in the state and they own property in the state. So our present assessment system for the corporate taxes basically doesn't touch the four biggest companies in the state. Okay. So if you want to know why it is that our state is collecting so little in taxes from corporations, it's that system for assessment that needs to be changed. Okay. Any, any prospects of that changing? Anybody talking about that? I did notice that Representative Haas is from Beaverton, and I suspect that's why you won't see him bringing this subject up. Okay, all right. Any other changes in tax policy in Oregon that would be uh, beneficial? Yes. We should go ahead and raise the top end of the individual income tax. That would be a better thing than what they apparently are considering. Um, and there are other things. The governor has suggested, and quite sensibly, because the governor has suggested that health care and hospitals um, need to pay more taxes because of what's happening to the budget in terms mm -hmm. of what's, what's, what's coming into them they need to go ahead and in part pay back for. So there are things like that. Um, I was thinking of the mortgage deduction. The mortgage deduction, <laughs> it's unfair. Um, I don't know whether it's politically wise to go after it. Um, you, could, you could change the mortgage, de mortgage deduction so that people with very expensive homes and people with second homes wouldn't be taking advantage of it. Mm -hmm. And it would still be something that somebody who's a homeowner, who's a middle class person would be able to take advantage of. And that would be favorable. And the, what you saved in that um, should go into programs for affordable housing, which is a huge crisis we face. Mm -hmm. um, but politically, um, you've got to be very careful. And I've learned that you, know, you, might, have, you might have honed tuned your policy so that it doesn't hurt a middle class person. But if you can't convince them of that, be careful. Mm -hmm. and, it is true that right now the mortgage interest deduction is one of the few tax breaks that a middle income person gets. So you would have to be very, very, you'd have to be sure, I think, that you could explain it accurately yep. before you'd want to go there. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, I need to cut you off. Okay. Thank you very much for being here. Hey, it's good to be with Great. you. We'll have to come back and have you do a whole series of uh, tax question uh, programs. So uh, we have been uh, talking with Robin Hanel, co-director of economics for equity and the environment. More information on that program is available on their website at e3network.org. I hope that you have a progressive populist tomorrow. Thank you for watching. Bye.